Welcome to another episode of Stare It Up. Today, my guest is the infamous, what I call him, the piano instructor, teacher, um, lover of music, and many other things, Rich Julius Richardson. Um, welcome, and thank you for coming on short notice. Happy to be here. Thank you. So, we're talking today about music and how it inspires so many parts of our lives and it has a potential career and so many different things about music right and i always say that you're living my dream life in many ways right because we all kind of do what we have to do to survive and we do work based on what we've been trained to do right and you literally quit your day job one day to the next or maybe you had some planning right and decide that you're going to do something you love. Do you want to tell us about that journey? Yeah, I... Uh, so, probably from when I was really young, as I can remember, maybe maybe age six or seven, that's when I really recollect listening to... My dad would put on um, music from Beethoven, Bach, Tchaikovsky, you know, all these great classics. Um, they were being conducted by Bernstein um, Karyan, I think, and then Abado. These are, like, I grew up later to find out these were, like, top of their game. You know, American, I Italian, I think Austrian, right? So I grew up around that music, and I, I think he noticed that every time he put it on, wherever I was, I would you know, show up to some corner, come and sit down and just listen through. You're drawn to it. And I was drawn to it. So I think when I was nine, um, I'd fallen ill for a while, probably like three months. I don't know what it was, back and forth, fever with malaria and all of that. And he comes to my room and he says, look, if you get better, I'll buy you a piano. Well, tell him short of it, the very next day. You were better? I was better. I never <laughs> fell sick again, yada, yada, yada. I got a piano at nine. I got a really good instructor at 10. Um, and yeah, I've been with the piano ever since till, till now. Um, and so fast forward after uni, a life in software, life in hardware, in terms of infrastructure and networking. Then took a job at Ecobank, uh, I think 2007. July 2013, you know, I don't know if you call it a midlife crisis or whatever <laughs> it is, but it wasn't planned, okay? okay? It wasn't really planned. It was just, it was a slow grinding to a halt, if you like, where you just feel, I don't know whether it's a monotony or whatever it was, but I have to say that my work in Ecobank, I loved very much. It was uh, on the path of ideation, you know, we literally started discussing the idea of transaction banking, you know, the bank kind of carried it further into an actual project, which now is, you know, a significant part of the bank's in income. So I, I feel very proud about that work. And so most people were like, why would you, you know, slave away, do that? It's just on the ascendancy and you're like, you're leaving. But I would say that maybe the, the signs were on the wall. My, my twin brother is an architect. I admire him, you know, to bits. He's very successful at what he does. And that doesn't really help for somebody, you know, who's not too sure. So I, I kind of decided, look, how bad can I can it be? <laughs> Maybe 10 years later, you know, I'll, I'll figure this out. So I came out. I didn't really think about it. I just came out and said, let's make this happen. So you and just decided that you want to... Yeah, wanna... I left. I think the first six months, I just go, I bought a piano. And I was just playing at home, go drop my kids at school, come back. That was it. six months till I was like, okay, now I think I know what I want to do. So you didn't actually stop in service of going straight into music. No. It was... I'd, I'd probably had enough yeah. and my thought was go find something that feels like play. 
But that's brave. Um, I like to think that I'm a, you know, I'm in a position of privilege, and that's something that a lot of people, you know, probably don't say. And I'm not, you know, this is not a joke. It's 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 a function that, as people go ahead, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So what about you know parents? And I, I owe a lot to my parents and my family. You know, uh, because of what exists there, I can make such a decision, right? I, I don't think if I was in my dad's time where he was the sole person and a lot of people were depending on the whole village, I could have, you know, made those decisions. I just have to suck it up and be happy with what I had. But in this construct, I had the opportunity to go try and I didn't have as many dependents except my kid. Uh, my wife was extremely supportive and understood that I just had to go do this. So when I say it's so brave mm -hmm. and you respond about you think you're in a position of privilege, yes. I think what I love about that thought is you, you acknowledging that you are blessed in a certain way, right? Very. Because a lot of the time we don't realize the privileges, no matter how big or small that we have. And it's nice to hear you acknowledge and say, I'm blessed to be able to do something that I that I absolutely And love. with that blessing comes a great responsibility. Absolutely. So you can't while away that time and not have anything to show for it. Yeah. And so, you know, it doesn't make it any easier. No, it it's, doesn't. It's just that you, you jumped off and you're going to have to show, you know, that this works eventually. So, yeah, we're still dreaming and hoping we figure it out. So, you talked about your love for classical music um, and just how drawn you were to it as a child. Um, but you live in Africa. Sure. And now, however many years later, you are helping kids mm -hmm. learn and appreciate classical music, right? Mm -hmm. And I know, yes, it's becoming a broader genre now with the Yanis of this world who are beginning to do more contemporary um, classical music and so on. Mm -hmm. But within our cultural context, why did you make that choice? Because it's not something that's everyday music for the Ghanaian person. I think, you know, the, the question of why classical music is, you, you can look at it on so many different, you know, fronts. Um, but maybe the bigger subject of a classical education, you know, uh, because within that, the arts, music, um, science, math, right? There, there is a school of thought that we've, we've not nearly gotten here. I'm, I'm talking about the world as it is. Um, we've gotten here out of certain practices and some of these things are repetitive, um, developing the mind, developing the imagination, um, and essentially feeding curious minds. All right. So as far as that's concerned, classical music historically has not appealed to the masses. Sure. It's always been the preserve of select few. a select few, but a, with a specific characteristic around most of them you'd find, I mean, if you go back to the 1500s, you find the music in the king's courts and the churches and all that. And it seems to be a, you know, a particular appeal to a certain kind of people. In every society, you do have that. So this is not an attempt to make... It mass suddenly. I hope it goes. Yeah. It's, it's almost like Steve Jobs saying, think different, you know, he makes phones for... He believes that in every space, no matter if everybody wants to go in one direction, he knows there's going to be a guy who, if everybody wears a raincoat, he's going to come, you know, and just do the opposite, yes. right? So there are always going to be people who are a bit different and X, Y, Z. So it's not so much to pander to the masses. No, that's not what it is. But to acknowledge that, um, obviously, in our journey um, into the future, because you have to look at us as a continuous project, um, what will happen is more people will spend a lot of time climbing up that ladder in terms of the mind. And when that happens, you'll find ultimately that there'll be very few things that really appeal. So in that sense, you know, why classical music? Yes, because it's a, um, I mean, the, there is a direct correlation with where it thrives. It's still thriving today. Right, it's seen even more billions of dollars in investment. This, ex except that, where would you see that investment? So, for most people, I ask them, 
and I, my students ask them, it's either the people sitting here are really stupid or they know something we don't that know. That we don't know. Right. So last week, I was showing them a video from, I think it was Berlin Philharmonic or the Said Center. And in that audience, is roughly maybe about, if I'm not wrong, a thousand people. And there's a cellist sitting right in the middle and he's playing for two hours. And people are silent and listening. And I ask them, why are they doing that? What is in it for them? There are two things happening. Most of the people in there have a very good appreciation for what's happening in the sense of physically, you know, having to understand what it means to get down the instrument. But then transcending that, this instrumental person who most of them probably have played the piece, yeah. but then they see this person for the, you know, for what he's doing and they, they can relate to, wow, that's got to be really difficult, yeah. right? Um, but more importantly, it would seem that act itself gives them that space to unwind or to believe that things are possible. And these are for people who, and I made it my business to find the caliber. Yeah. Most of them are inventors, scientists, um, thinkers, you know. And so it has a special appeal. And I feel that as a nation long term, it's not that everybody's a thinker, but that you need to get that right and down the line that will become and, and, and it's just even a place to be present and be mindful, right? Right. right and right. enjoy something. Um, I, w when it comes to joy, you know, it's it's almost like if you've never experienced something um, or never had to bother, it doesn't quite appeal to you. That's true. If I take you through it and you, you get to understand what the person is trying to do, it's almost like art or a good painting. If you're looking at any of those impressionists, you know, and then now into modern, you could go then for the like of you, why is this even a painting that we're looking at? Some people actually feel that a painting must represent a symbolic, physical, oh. you know, right? And then you go and you see these... Splattered uh, paint all know, over the place. Yeah, Bastille or whatever his name is, Baptiste, right? Yeah. All these paintings, you think this is rubbish. And then you see somebody buy it for several millions of dollars and you think, what is there? It's... It's just an acquired taste, and over time, we will get there. I, I'm confident that people will come to understand what it is. Yeah. You know, growing up, we had all these ideal careers, yeah. right? So you had to be an engineer, or mm. you had to be an architect, a doctor. or a doctor, or a lawyer, right? Mm. Um, and as we've grown up, we've also realized that, oh, there's, there are huge opportunities in tennis and in mm. music and mm. in football, right? right? There are times where I say that, oh, maybe I should let my daughter start playing tennis early Earlier. because then do that yeah. with my retirement plan. Emma, Emma Raducanu <laughs> goes to the uh, U.S. Open okay. and wins her first time. Yes. $2.5 million. That's enough seed for... That is a big seed. Yeah. And when I think about that, I think about all the parents who are investing in their kids and the expectations they have, not necessarily as a retirement plan like I joked about earlier, sure. but just even... To make so sure that they go on and succeed and thrive and... And they're independent, yeah. right? right? What do you tell an everyday dad mm. who has a gifted son right. in service of fueling and supporting that gift of being an excellent guitarist or pianist or whatever? Okay. I, I, I think that um, in this journey, we're going to be very careful. Uh, and, and none of the um, push string is wrong. It's just a function of where you are in your journey. True. So s for some parents, imagine somebody coming out of some, you know, village, right? He doesn't have that luxury. I don't think so, generally. And, you know, I, 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 I stand to be corrected. I don't think that would be his mindset. And so it might be a bit ludicrous on their part, you know, to get so creative. I think the part that would be laid out for them very clearly is safe and survival mode, yeah. right? And the advice will go this way. You be the top of your class and hope to get, you know, into some of the highest places. This would be the case and they would really thrive, right? Um, in that same preserve of family, it can be reflected onto nation, right? So if you take a nation, 
a nation might say we're just purely survival mode. I'm afraid when it comes to Ghana, that's exactly that's where what we I are. think. Yeah. It is what it is. There's nothing you can do about it. But within that same element, within that same construct of family, there'll be equally another family and they might possibly all be in the same class. But they're looking at things differently. So what is this? Do I think of my child as somebody who is getting all that training so he gets a job? For such a person, the thought will follow a trend of where should he be placed. So, Because there are stories of people who are brilliant enough to do medicine or whatever, and parents would come and say, no, I want to go do investment banking. Yeah. And even if they were willing and saying, no, I really want to do medicine, they might get a strong dad or mom say, no, I'm sorry, it's going to be law, you know, because I can see the future there. But that's ironic, isn't it? Because into the future we match welcome AI, right? <laughs> and when that, that is replacing many roles today. You have no idea. Yeah, even right? like lawyers. Yeah, you have no idea, idea. right? Uh, there are things that people said, oh, that can never happen. And they're waking up realizing it doesn't exist anymore. You know, when we were right? growing up, you watched Doctor Who. And that was probably one of the most sophisticated things at the time. And we right. thought it would never happen. And right. we've gone past that, past way it. past Way it. past. I mean, um, and, and, and so that's the one dimension. The other dimension, and, and that's still answering that question for that parent. So either way, it's fine because we're all taking that you know big risk. But there'll be the other parent that possibly understands the bigger game okay. of the imagination. You know, people usually say, oh, you know, don't build castles in the air and, you know, get serious. You know, you've had an imaginative child who, you know, wants to tinkle around with a story. And one of the most surprising things is, I mean, this is 1998. I'm watching Michael Jordan um, take his last ring. And typically after the games, they'll show the X Games. I don't know if you know the X Games, the roller skate, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And at this time, I ask myself, how silly can this be? I mean, how can people go do this sort of stuff? Until once I read that the guy who wins that thing, you know, is being paid in the millions of dollars and X, Y, Z. And it's it surprising because I see the birth of something that never existed, never right? So people participate a lot in the imagination. There is something that didn't exist. I have created it to exist and it flourishes and it works. Are you a Sapiens fan? Or have you read it? <laughs> or you this is my third time. <laughs> and this oh, time I'm reading third? it with my sons. Okay. And it's, oh. Because then they give you the, the path, the trajectory. And it, it seems to stamp with authority that there is a reason why we're where we are in the whole chain. Yeah. And that those who really get ahead are those who are busy about the creative and feeding the imagination. And so, if you're a parent and you're looking long term, and, and this is also a function of genetics as well. Look, my kids, I always say, only had one music class. Okay. And I was like, that's not possible. I came and my son was figuring out how to read a piece of music. I was like, are you getting this from school or, you know? He says, no. So, but how come you can see that? He says, yeah, I know, that's, that's what this is. And you kind of got, it got me thinking. I mean, recently I started teaching my twin brother's daughter as well. And it was the same thing. Everything is extremely easy for her. My sons are not certified, uh, excited about playing the instruments as I do, and I don't force them to. But they can play at an extremely high level. They probably did what I got to do with a lot of structure and depth and time. They do it at ease in, in, in a couple of hours. And so the subject of genetics comes to play. If I start pushing my son to hit a pool and to swim as often, you do know that on the path of evolution, adaptation kicks in. Yeah. It's possible I have a grandchild who just knows swimming yeah. far better than most just people. By virtue just of by virtue of that, people have done. So, so people have different and reasons even your for pushing body begins to, to adapt, adapt and then all of that sort of stuff. Um, you read Sapiens and they tell you that old human had really big, large molars and teeth. And the real reason was because we were chewing things that needed stronger teeth. Yeah. And now we don't because, you know, we're at the top of the food chain. We get to chew the meat. And <laughs> after it's cooked. <laughs> after it's cooked. So we're, we're, we're doing very well. Yeah. But essentially, those would be the motivations. Survival, 
versus somebody who understands that I'm part of a genetic construct, I'm part of an evolution, I'm trying to give my children the best so that my grandchild down the line, you know, manifests some of these things. Bach, the great musician J.S. Bach, is in a family of 500, I think chronicled from 500 um, beasts, you know, after death, so AD, all the way to 1500. You have no idea how prolific he is. I mean, Bach's 24 prelates and fugues is far deeper than anything you've heard anybody creating these parts. And it's just too difficult. Well. It's too complex, yeah. but it's beautiful. And you are wondering, wow, is that the human mind? I mean, for you to just get through it and then get told that he wrote it in a number of years, and then it will take you probably several years to do just one. Yeah. You know, it puts you on that path. So, you know, I don't know if that, that no, gives you. It, it, it definitely does. It, mm. it, it's a, pretty much you're telling me it's not a one size fits all. It's not a one size fits all. Um, it has some value, it has extreme value. It may not have immediate value, yeah. and that's not what it's about. And it's being able to see into the future and say... So the big societies that promote this um, acknowledge that not everybody will continue around that trajectory because historically it hasn't appealed to the masses. Yes. But one thing that they do for sure is to invest in the audience of tomorrow because the audience for it mm -hmm. at least understands what it's about. Yeah. We, we haven't even scratched the surface exactly. of aha. Uh -huh. And it's not so much of going to play back and Beethoven, but appreciating the works and then migrating up to become an Ephraim Amu or a J. Chinkitia or a composer of sorts. And it won't be all of us, it'll just be a few. But that's okay, it's, it's part of the trajectory. You know, when you talked about genetics, I'd had a conversation with an earlier guest, um, a previous guest, and we had talked about happiness. And there was one study by Sonja Lubrinsky. I can't remember what the surname is. I'm never able to pronounce it. Right. And she talks about how our happiness is based on three things. So the first thing is 10% is what happens to you in life. 40% um, is within. So what happens to you in life, meaning you get married, you get divorced, you have children, you lose a parent. So the right. events, right? Um, and then 40% is based on... Uh, how you respond to things. So it's under your control. Right. So if someone said to you, oh, you were an idiot, mm. you could decide to say, oh, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Or you could actually take that on and feel bad about it and it would affect how you were feeling. Mm. And guess what? The remaining 50% is genetics. Oh, I like that reaction. Really? Yep. How 50% so? of your happiness is based on genetics. So it's how you are, your parents, what they were predisposed to, the experiences, um, the kind of work that they did, um, the activities they engaged in. So you know like your genetic code, and even in terms of drug use, right? I see. So all, a lot of things actually eventually affect, uh, affect, affect you your, in time. In time, wow, right? I didn't know and that. So fifth, I'll send it to you. Mm. But I, I, I was saying to her, I did a study in the science of happiness and well-being. Right. And that's where I found it. But I had the exact same reaction as you did. Mm. And so when we think about genetics, it's way beyond just even color of your skin, um, it's way beyond just your behavioral patterns, but it's also just how you even respond to things and how you, how even it affects things as basic as your... I mean, I got led on to uh, the genetic angle from a conversation with He pulled my mind to the subject of genetics that she doesn't have a choice in the matter, right? <laughs> this is not about her. And he says, it's about future generations. And I was like, what do you mean, future generations? Have you not been told that the things you do repetitively are getting written down into this gene construct yes. and will pass yes. on? Once you understand that, yes. and once you explain that to your children, I think, and whether that's an important thing for you, mm -hmm. right? I have a classmate, I always laugh. He, he will eat all the fufu, all the meat, and he's slimmer and has a six pack, and we're all jealous, right? Even at this point. Yeah. And we're like, ah, by you. And then we discover that his granddad has been a sportsman, like that guy has paid the bills for you oh. long ago, <laughs> yes. and you are like, you know, and, yeah. and we kind of toy yeah. with these things, but yeah. I think the science also shows that, you know, we, we, it gets carried down. So if you have that thought in, in mind and you understood it, then having even a conversation with the most obstinate child up who thinks this is, you know, not, not it, once they understood it, because I think she understood it at a point and she's a fantastic pianist, you should is see it? her play now. Yeah. And, and you know, sometimes it's also about 
knowing that you've got to do this, right? So you, you, you carry on, uh, you know. I mean, over the years, parents have dragged, literally dragged, forced children and all that. And <laughs> at different stages, they will finally come <laughs> and then say to you, the mom or dad, thank you for making me do this, yeah. right? Yeah. And some of us have been convinced that's surely the path. I'm afraid to say there are also some stories where the kids have vowed never to come back home. So it's a very dicey, you know, point. I, I try to negotiate the path and say, hey, look. No, I was going to ask is, you about yeah. that. So what do Because you I have boys, right? Yeah. And I have to be able to convince them, guys, when you do the grade 8 exam, you know, I did it when I was 14. You are 14 now. I think you can. Let's keep, you know, the family tradition. But more importantly, let's hand this down to the next generation. So... You know, they, they, well, I have good boys. Let's just say that, you know. You're blessed with that. I'm blessed with that. No, yeah. but it, it, it's interesting because yeah. I was going to ask you about when is a good time to start mm. the lessons because mm. mm. I didn't start till... Mm -hmm. So one of my daughters is, is on the guitar and the other is mm. on the piano. Mm. They both decided what they wanted to do. Mm. And they are 14 and 12. Right. Um, and I have taken the stance, you're going to do this. Okay. And I said, you need They'll to enjoy around, it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to enjoy it because you're going to do this for two years. Right. And then we'll see where it goes. So why do you want to do you want to be miserable mm. doing this or you want to begin to embody a bit of it? One of them seems to be getting with the program. One of them is still kind of still waddling her way through right. it. Right. Mm. But what I wanted to understand was. I know it's not a one size fits all, mm. but when do you know to pull back? Because you just said some will never come back home, right? Because right, they feel right. like. <laughs> you, you really upset them. And, yes. you know. I, I just feel that, um, I mean, and I'll tell it in this way I had students in, you know, who I used to teach who left for London to go to school. And they would come back and they would insist I had done them a disservice. I was like, what did I do wrong? And they're like, you need to tell everybody this is really important. I was like, what? why are you saying this is really important? Um, and they'd be in class, and they're in a class where, if you can imagine this, everybody knew how to play an instrument. instrument. Yeah. It's not, um, and I think, unfortunately, in our part of the world, the mindset is you have to be gifted to do it. But that's been demystified for centuries now. Um, so in their classes, everybody plays an instrument. At a very so high level of proficiency. Aside from being the odd one out, they're, they're hopefully trying to communicate that this is not a preserve of those who want to do it. Yeah. Right? It's part of an education. Um, which would mean that in their constructs or wherever they are, it's prioritized and everybody is told you're getting with the program. In which case, we won't be having a conversation of what do you do with a child? Should I if I? <laughs> Should I if I? Right? So they have a whole. A community that's enabling that. Which instruments should your children play in their communities? Because they are um, in their concerts literally every week. Mm. Children get to interact with music from when they're really toddler all the way to when they're really sure. And they would come to you and say, "I want to do a flute." They won't be saying that off the whim. It would be usually because they've gone for that and that, and they can associate. Uh, you see that the real world kids are running through museums. Mm -hmm. Kids are doing massive libraries. They're even building the largest libraries now. Yeah. We have no libraries in Ghana, you know, right? We, we, we don't think it has any place. The, the subject of reading, the arts mm -hmm. and music, I genuinely believe that we don't think so. We, we, we think it's you know, just science. I have, I have news for a lot of people. Everything you're doing in science comes from the arts. It's the imagination. Um, Take a look at Star Wars, 1977, George Lucas, right, and the group. They're thinking about hoverboard technology. They're thinking about space travel, Star Trek, all that sort of stuff. And at the point, they don't have any of this, right? We don't even have the internet. But they can imagine it, right? And as much as they can imagine, you have ideas like the single cycle, uh, wheel cycle, yeah. right? And today it's there. Yeah. So it's almost like from the imagination comes the path, right? And so that wouldn't be a problem in their world. And, and children who are here, who never get music, would go there and suddenly get it. On this side, I take a stance. I never force any of my children to play. I typically would take the first month or two. Most of them, unfortunately, are in survival mode. So because they're in survival mode, it's the conversations at home. Yeah. Because that's reinforcing a certain mindset. Yeah. 
which is I've got to survive. So I've had students go like, what are you going to do with this? And, you know, sometimes I try to explain to them, but these days I've, I've stopped. I'm, I'm more of, if you don't get it, you know, it's let's just wait. wait. Uh -huh. Let's, <laughs> let's wait you know, you it's, it's really not for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but societally, things could be done to influence that where they don't feel like the odd person out. Because most of them are really good students who are like, nobody does this. I mean, yeah. why am I doing this? What's the point? Yeah. Um, and then I had students who, parents were very clear that they were not just being trained for here and it's a big deal outside. Okay. So some of the people dovetailed that against scholarships and a whole and billions of dollars for scholarship, not to go do music, but to support people who have an appreciation of music in whichever field of endeavor. So those who know what that is will exploit that, right? Kenya does that a lot, yes. you know, big scale. Ghana is not even a week to that, but that would be the thing. So you have all those different motivations. I would simply say, I'm the teacher who doesn't force any student. I don't even force my kids, so how am I going to be of help? So I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I'm a fairly liberal mother, right, in terms of the conversations I have with the kids and my engagements with them. I, am, I have the OCD component when it comes to keeping your room clean and do things a certain way and doing your work. You don't have to say this to me, I'm, I understand <laughs> what I'm looking at. Yeah, go ahead. But the one thing that I would say is, as a parent, I feel a strong sense of responsibility to help my kids see things they don't see. Right. And it's interesting, my younger daughter acknowledges that this is the one thing that I'm actually insisting that they do. Right. And it's coming late, right? Because I didn't start when they were six or seven and that it was a mindless activity for them. Right. But guess what, once she appreciated that and she then She's the one who's actually tapping into tapping, it. Tapping mm. into it, right? I think my older daughter is, is getting there gradually, mm. gradually. And having that conversation where this is good for you, it opens your mind in so many different ways that you couldn't even imagine. It's you become multi skilled, right? Um, it's something that, that could be a getaway from stress, you know, as you get older because And you are definitely going to be in good company in the future. I, I usually also mention this bit. So in that part of being liberal and negotiating and having conversations with your children, well, I don't know which you know, side of you grew up in, in your family, but ours was not no, no, no liberal. Yeah. Much later, yeah. we were having serious yeah. conversations and that was appreciated. Yeah. But there was a program and you were following yes. it. There is a good side to negotiating that yeah. and having the conversations. Because what happens is they then get to also be part of the conversation. Yeah. And if what you're given is either really strong logic or very factual, sometimes they won't say yes immediately, but they will go back and say, okay, I don't have an argument against this or why not? Yeah. And therefore I will carry around that part. So that's definitely encouraged. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention is in the subject of human excellence, not just academic excellence, right? Human excellence will then transcend, and maybe you can bear me out. A good education has a lot of worth, right? In sense of, I know what's around me, I have great ideas, and hopefully I can improvise, yeah. right? And be useful in the work market. But look, I, for the likes of me, I know people who haven't worked as hard as every other person and live extremely comfortable lives. Right. Yeah. And the key to that has always been networks. Who are you going to network with? What, what networks are you building? Are you what in? company are you keeping? Okay. Yeah. It's something that I don't say to a lot of people, but sapiens again. Yeah. The company you keep, mm -hmm. right? It's those who collaborate, those, you know, you're hanging around people who are doing amazing things and who enjoy your company genuinely. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, also a very important thing. So I tell most people, this instrument puts you in really good company. And uh, if ever there was a case which then dovetails into survival, this would be the one. So pretty much my last question, well, maybe my last but one mm. question. This is you making a significant life decision. When you look back on the choice to walk this path um, and making this switch, how has it been? And what do you see on the horizon for yourself? It definitely hasn't been easy um, in the sense of 
the car is already moving and you have changed the tires, right? Um, you still have bills to pay. You have to figure it out. I'm not truly vested only in music, and this is why most of the time I talk about my family, um, and I speak on the position of uh, privilege. So in terms of survival, um, I'm still very much also steeped into work outside of music. Music has taken a, f a front and center stage, mm -hmm. and that you know enables me to do the other things. Mm -hmm. So the other things have become the other things. Music but music is, is, the is the thing, right? Um, and so in that regard, you know, it's kind of, we're coasting. Um, but the work has to be done. The children that we're working with training um, and hoping to inspire in the future, that work is happening. It's happening 20 students at a time, 30 students at a time. You get, you've got children in the orphanage in SOS who are playing. We've done already some years with children in Kinder uh, Paradise. Um, and some of them have gone on to music school and are, you know, uh, thriving and beyond even thriving. Um, and much recently, I've also bumped into a group of people m whose journey is much like myself, some younger, you know, some probably the same age, who've also, you know, had this uh, experience of music and have been playing at the highest levels, coming together to form the Accra Chamber Orchestra. And I think this year we'll be doing you know, something around there. I mean, in terms of the foreseeable future, I put it this way, what does anybody do with a, a really professional orchestra? What do you do with it? And if you think around it, think not too far from the BBC. A British Broadcasting Corporation has truly made its orchestra the, it's, it's extremely modern in terms of its thought. I don't know if you saw the recent video where Sar Kodir, you know, was invited and I think he visited yeah, them and, you know, they kind of played along with him and boy, right? But beyond that, they, they are able to imagine what to do with the sound, yeah. right? And the soundtracks that they are creating, all the movies you are watching. I mean, last time they held the Grammys, right? And we're sitting here in this country saying, what do you do with music? How d can you yeah. be, right? People are building castles in the air. And they're multi-millionaires. There none of there's nobody in this range yeah. equal to the wealth of Jay Z, mm -hmm. right? It's not classical music, but it's music, music. The subject of music. So if you're ever in doubt on what it could be used for, mm -hmm. so the question then dovetails: What do you use a great orchestra for? Mm -hmm. um, so on the path on the horizon, we will get there in terms of the quality of the sound. But more importantly, um, maybe that will spare a lot of people on to find. Um, new possibilities for that capability. That's what I'll say. I think that you talking about possibility is very inspiring in the sense that that's what we seek out as people, right? We want to explore, we want to see things differently. Yeah. And it's great to hear that music could be opening these doors and these windows in very, very interesting ways for sure. us. Sure. Thank you for coming here. Thank it's you for having really me. It's been really good again. having this conversation. Probably one of my best conversations. That's not about love and happiness and health and all of That's that. That's also very important. It's also very <laughs> important. Thank you. Julia. Thank you for having me. All right. So to the fun part of this. Um, I've made your cocktail. Right. I will tell you one thing that's in it. So you can guess, you can tell me 20 things. I'll only admit to one. Because I'm not giving away any of my trade secrets now. Okay. So let's see. Mm -hmm. there we go. And then I'll look at your reaction because you know people have different reactions. Sometimes it's too strong. Sometimes it's. Mm. Are you guessing? Is there anything tonic in it? No, there's no tonic. Vodka. Well, Everybody vodka. goes straight for the vodka, <laughs> <laughs> so there's no more vodka yeah. going in. <laughs> no more vodka. Anyway, so thank you for Cheers. coming. Just staring it up.